everyone. My name is Jenny. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Ingram School of Nursing. Um, so I've been doing research for a number of years since I was in undergrad, actually. And I did my undergraduate degree in nursing and then my master's degree in education. So I've kind of been um, doing a wide variety of research that really range from health research to, edu to health education to, to a little bit of educational psychology as well. And so I've seen different types of research and research manuscripts and have written a couple myself. I have uh, numerous publications. And so I'm going to just walk you through today, um, Research Report Writing 101. Um, so I'm going to start my, um, my presentation. Before I start, does anybody have any questions? You're very welcome to put them in the chat if you're not comfortable um, turning on your microphone. Um, otherwise, I think we can get started. And if um, um, Sydney or Ellie, if you can help me monitor the chat, sometimes I just don't see things that, uh, that happen while I'm presenting. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so Research Report Writing 101. This is just an introduction for effective communication when you're doing academic research and submitting for peer-reviewed publications. Um, this is a pretty high-level overview. I'm aware that most of you might not be from the health um, health sector. Some of you might be from like uh, general sciences, lab-based work. But for the most part, these um, different kinds of research reports look pretty similar. I would just recommend that after this, if you're looking to write something specific to your area of study, to look at um, the published manuscripts in your area, just to make sure that, that you're following kind of what's accepted. Um, but essentially, the purpose of a research manuscript is to communicate your research findings and to contribute to a body of knowledge within your own specific field. So within the context of this uh, presentation, we're going to learn how to, we're going to understand like the fundamental components of a research manuscript. You're going to learn how to structure and present your research findings effectively. And then I'll highlight some of the common pitfalls when it comes to this like writing process. Um, because some of these different sections of a manuscript can be confusing and difficult. Um, so in terms of scope, I'm really gonna focus on the structure, style, and key elements of, a, of effective academic research reports intended for peer review publications. Um, I'm not gonna cover any like in-depth methodological um, parts just because that, that will really depend on your field of study or how to like interpret, analyze data. So um, strictly really looking at the structure and writing components. So I'll go through these different components, highlight the tips, and then we'll have that Q&A session at the end. Okay, any questions? Okay, so I'm going to continue. Um, in terms of the components of a research report, the main components are really the abstract introduction, methods, results, and then your discussion and conclusion section. Um, I'm structuring this presentation kind of like a little bit of a case study as well. So um, I'm going to use the exemplar study, which was published by one of my research colleagues called the day-to-day -day experiences of caring for children with osteogenesis imperfecta. This is a qualitative study. Um, so I know a lot of you are probably doing quantitative research or interested in that, but again, mostly pretty much the same, just some like minor methodological differences. Um, so we'll go through first part is the abstract. This is usually the first thing that you see when you open up a research report, like when you're on Google Scholar and you read the research report. Um, it's a concise summary of your entire research. So it's usually between 250 to 400 words. And it includes usually things like the purpose, methods, key findings, and conclusions. Um, it can be structured or unstructured. So I'll go through what these two different types look like. And it essentially the purpose is to enable readers to quickly ascertain um, the purpose of your research, if it's relevant, and what its significance is. Um, in terms of tips for writing the abstract, I actually usually write the abstract at the end. I know we're starting with this. I'm just going in order of what you see when you open a research report, but I write this at the very end once I have all the other components. Um, and it's really just most important to understand the purpose of your study and to really direct how you write your abstract towards this purpose and to keep it concise using clear and simple language. Those are really the key tenets. Um, essentially, you want somebody who is not in your field of study, in your field of research, to be able to read your abstract and understand um, what its general, what it, what its contributions are, and what your study's general purpose is. 
Um, on this, on the left-hand side, you can see that these are two different types of abstracts. The one on the bottom is a structured abstract. So structure just means that you have like the subheading introduction, materials and methods, results and conclusion, while an unstructured one is written in, in the form of a singular paragraph. But you can still, as you can see, the author here highlighted kind of where the background is, where the purpose is located, how the methods were done. So your reader should still be able to locate each of those main parts of an abstract. Okay. So in terms of the introduction, this really sets the background context and the research problem via review of the relevant um, literature. Your most important thing for the abstract is to problem research. So your background and your con your background, I kind of think of that as the def as like the main topic of your paper. So for example, in the exemplary study that um, I'm gonna show you in just a second, um, we're really looking at osteogenesis imperfecta. It's called brittle bone disease. And so the author will start by defining what that is. Then the context will really be like the current state of the topic. What are the issues at hand? And all of that goes to inform ultimately your research problem. So, which is what's missing from the present knowledge base. At the end of your introduction, you need to state your, the, object, the objectives, your research questions and the significance of your study. So why should I care? Why are you conducting the study? And why is it worth my time to read? Um, so before I do that, I'm gonna show you guys this paper. Can you all, can you all see? Yep, we see. Okay, perfect. So as you can see that this author, this is the paper that I'm using as exemplary um, paper. The author has here a structured abstract. This depends on whatever journal you're submitting to. In the introduction here, she actually structured it with an introduction, a background setting, a background, um, and a background section. So the background is essentially the context here. In the introduction, she first introduces what osteogenesis imperfecta is. And this gives us information about um, about OI um, and and what kind of disease it is. Then, in terms of the background, um, there she starts talking about how um, kind of the context of the study. So, when a child has OI, this parents usually adopt the role of a primary caregiver, and so challenges of the primary caregivers when they're caring for a child with OI. Here I highlighted they have this, they have a major uh, problem statement. So they kind of start showcasing the current um, state of these families' lives who have children with this rare uh, genetic bone uh, condition. And then they make a problem statement saying that while several studies um, on the OI family experiences have included some analysis of their day-to-day -day lives. None of these studies focused on the minutiae and routines of daily care. So you can see here, she starts to go into, okay, well, what's missing in the current state of the research? And then finally, what this study contributes, which is really characterized by this sentence. Here. The study sought to better understand the daily experiences of family caregivers of children living um, with OI. And so that's really what I mean when I say you need to convince the reader that your paper is worth reading. Where is the problem? What's missing? Um, and then you need to provide a rationale for why you conducted your study. So in her case, she set the problem and then how her study seeks to fill this gap in research. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. The methodology I find is typically one of the easier parts to write. To write. Um, however, it is very detail focused. So when you're doing the methods, you need to describe your research design, your procedures, and of course the methods used. So design choices can, uh, when you're explaining your design choices, you need to rationalize why you made certain decisions over others. This could be because, this could be, for example, why you use a certain framework, why you used a specific survey, um, why you use your uh, certain tool. tool. Um, oftentimes, there will be um, valid logical reasons. So like if you're using a specific theory, you wise theory um, aligns with the purpose of your study. Um, or for example, if you have like certain uh, tools, like what would be uh, 
uh, tool or the tool, um, or if you have a survey that like this is commonly used, it has really good like, metrics, et cetera. But I've seen some in our own field. Um, for data collection, you need to explain how your data was gathered. So tools did you use? Um, how did you use them? When did you use them on your team? Things like things like that. Um, and then finally, present you took to the end. So the point of your method reproduce the reviewer's paper wants to know that you took the adequate steps to make sure that it that things work done systematically and that your data collection is not flawed. You didn't just make arbitrary choices and that you really thought through each part of your study. I'll show you now um, from the from the so I'm back on the, uh, this is the template again. Uh, you can, again, this is a kind of uh, one that the fields that you a little bit different, but for the moment, the principle is still aligned. She starts by stating what the study methodology over the zone what is that associative descriptive study. Um, um, for example, one of the key things that you should justify when you're doing a qualitative research study is sample size. So like, why did we choose to recruit 12 participants or 15 participants or 25 participants? Here she talks about um, how based on their past experiences with these different types of OI families, um, our sample size of 15 to 18 characters was deemed adequate for achieving a new and richly um, textured understanding of the experience. So um, in the in qualitative research, you can often refer to other studies by saying like similar studies have used um, this sample size or similar studies have used these, these kinds of tools. That's a valid reason, um, but just make sure that like you are backing it up and showcasing that you've done your, your due diligence. Um, other components, for example, are um, here she starts to talk about kind of what data collection tools she used. So under the su subsection data collection, um, she talks about how she had a demographic survey. She talks about how they conducted interviews um, and provided that um, and stated um, how they developed their interview guide and how the interviews were conducted. So they were audio taped and transcribed here. So these are all like things that the reviewers are going to look for. Um, here they provided, for example, a table of some of the key interview questions. Um, so if interviews are a tool that you're using, you would need to provide, for example, like in the appendices, like um, an interview guide. Um, if you're using some sort of specialized tools in your appendices, you might have to describe like why you used, like how this machine works or um, what model the machine was, for example, if you're using machines to, to collect data. And then finally, um, she provides an overview of the data analysis. So this is for a qualitative data analysis. So I won't go through it because I know not all of you are doing qualitative research. If you're doing quantitative research, you would probably need to state, for example, like what um, software you use, like SPSS, what version, um, what kind of uh, quantitative analysis you did. So if that was descriptive or t-tests, things like that. Um, yeah, and things like that. So, and then if you're doing like wet lab things, you would kind of, you would need to go through sequentially kind of the steps that you took um, um, to do, to, to get to your results or findings. I'm gonna go back now. Um, common mistakes though, even though the methods seem pretty straightforward, common mistakes in this area, um, is really not providing enough details for reproducibility. So having very vague methods, um, providing irrelevant information. So this usually includes like, oh, sorry. Um, so providing irrelevant information. So information that's, that's not really related to the methods. Um, yeah, and then um, lack of justification. So this is a big one when you're not justifying justifying your design choices. You're gonna get the reviewers are gonna ask for that, and then um, non sequential description of your procedure. So 
that might include presenting your methods out of order or illogically. So it makes it really difficult um, for the reviewer to follow. So I would just recommend structuring your methods a little bit like the paper I showed with your subheadings. Um, and that usually helps to keep things organized. Um, finally, for your results, um, this is an objective presentation of all your findings. So you usually start with an overview, like when you're introducing your results for the first time, you'll start with an overview of major findings and connect these findings back to your research questions or objectives. That's a really important part of your results is that make sure that everything is actually easily linked to what your research questions or objectives were. Um, and I'll show you guys in a second, too, from the exemplary paper what I mean. When you're talking about your major findings in qualitative research, that usually means like the themes that came out of the your, in, your interview analysis. Um, and then you want to present your findings in a structured way. So this you can do, you, this is done via text and usually a combination of figures or tables. So if you're doing quantitative research, for example, you're going to probably have a lot of tables presenting um, kind of the p-value, the difference before and after, um, average age, average uh, like participant characteristics, things like that. Um, and then you usually close with a summary of your key findings again, and this helps to flow into the discussion section where you'll need to talk about these key findings. So I'll show you quickly from the exemplary paper what the results were. Um, again, this is for qualitative research, so for, but I, I think some of it still translates to the quantitative world. Um, just make sure that you're referring to your own field of study. But essentially, she starts presenting kind of the demographic data first, and this is important because it gives us an overview of kind of what the participants that she used were like. And then she talked about her caregiving theme. So this is what I mean when I say um, you need to clearly connect your some like your primary findings to research up to your research objectives, and then also make sure that you're highlighting those key findings. So she states the following themes um, relating to the day-to-day -day experience of OI caregiving were. Uh, identified and she lists them out. Um, and then for her, she organized her paper by each theme. So under each theme, she describes um, a little bit of what the family says. In qualitative research, you use these exemplary quotes a lot to kind of showcase and back up um, to back up your findings. You can also see here that she presents some data in the table. So like the demographic data is presented in the table here. I won't spend too long on this because I know it's not, this is not the type of study that will be relevant to everyone, but if you have more specific questions, you can save it for the end. Um, but essentially, you'll see here that she organizes it quite clearly with each of these themes having its own heading and its own dedicated section. Um. So common mistakes that happen when you're doing your results section is this I see all the time is um you start kind of discussing your results as you're presenting your findings. Um, and this includes presenting any kind of interpretation, analyses, or conjectures regarding your findings. Um, that's a very common one where, for example, if you catch yourself while you're writing your results section saying like, um, this finding could mean X, Y, and Z, or like this finding can be related to another finding that we have. That's that that's an X. It doesn't belong in the results section. It belongs in your discussion section. The results is really supposed to be quite simple, um, really just a straightforward presentation of what you found. Another thing that I often see is sometimes irrelevant data. So people... Um, will sometimes fluff up their manuscripts by presenting data that doesn't actually answer any of their research questions or objectives. So I know it can be tempting, but try to refrain from doing that. What I do when I'm writing the results section is that I have, I actually copy paste my objectives slash questions to the top of the page so that it's always there. And I always refer back to that when I'm writing just to make sure that I'm always hitting on those main points. And then finally, um, bias presentation is also a problem when, when people only present positive findings. Um, I see this sometimes in quantitative research where um, sometimes they don't want to present the fact that they didn't have findings for a certain point, so they just don't include it at all. Um, you'll see that sometimes negative findings or lack of findings are actually really telling and are great points for discussion. So make sure that you're really including like a global view and not um, cherry picking your your 
your uh, results when you're writing this section. And then finally, we move on to the discussion section. So this is um, typically the most challenging section for, for people to write. Um, essentially, when you're doing your discussion and conclusion, you want to highlight your key findings and their significance in the context of not just your own study, but the area, your, your field or area of research as a whole. This is now where you can interpret and analyze your findings. Um, so what I normally suggest is select a couple of the main findings. For me, that usually like averages out to like two or three, depending on the, my research questions and objectives, and make sure that they are, again, relevant to your research questions. Um, so questions that I ask myself when I'm writing the research, when I'm writing this, this, this section is, did my findings support my hypothesis? Why or why not? Um, this first question is for those of you that are in quantitative research. It might not be as relevant in qualitative research. And then second, how do my findings support or differ from pre-existing literature? Third, what can be learned from my findings or your lack of findings? And what do my findings add to the current body of knowledge, i.e. why do they matter? It always goes back to like why to why it matters, why I should care. Um, here I pre present a pretty structured view of what kind of how you can write your discussion. Again, you don't have to do it exactly this way, but this is, again, a high level overview of what um, a lot I see from most manuscripts when you're kind of starting out in research. The discussion section where you interpret your results will typically be like three to four paragraphs in length. You'll do like an overview of your study purpose again, why it's important. Just remind the readers kind of why you're writing this. Then you'll present your key findings and your and any unexpected results. So usually, again, two or three, you'll present what they mean and if they are supported by pre-existing literature. So go back to those questions that I had on the previous slide and ask yourself that for every finding, basically. Um, finally, at the end of that section, you'll want to do your takeaway, the takeaway of your research and its impact on your area of study. So do you have any recommendations to make for researchers in the future? What are future directions? What does it mean for... If you're doing a healthcare study, for example, what does it mean for policy or like clinical care? Um, this tip, after that, it's usually followed by a section on strengths or limitations. It's a little bit shorter, usually like two to three paragraphs. So strength is like what was unique about your study and how it improves upon previous methods or adds to the literature. And limitations are, of course, what could be improved upon. So for example, did you have a small sample size? Did one of your tools malfunction? Um, was time limited? Things like that that you can mention that may have impacted your study results. And there are always limitations. I think... I've seen research reports where, where people kind of say they, there's no limitations. That doesn't make you more credible. It actually makes you less credible. So always acknowledge what those limitations are. And then your conclusion, which is um, at, th at this point, um, just a high level restatement of your study, key findings, relevance, and then contributions to your field or study. Um, so I'm going to just show you briefly again, from the exemplary article, what the discussion could look like. You typically have a little bit more freedom when it comes to writing the, discuss the discussion because it will look different for everybody. So you'll see here that this author in the first paragraph provided an overview of the study purpose and contribution. So um, she starts by saying the study offered a comprehensive overview of the day-to-day -day experiences of caring for a child with OI, um, what it, like what her study actually did and um, um, kind of what those findings uh, indicated. So she says such supports could improve caregivers' daily experiences and improve their child's care. Um, so that's kind of what I mentioned before. And then here, um, you, you'll see that this is one paragraph of her results. So she presents, sorry, I'm going up and down here. So she presents um, her results here. Our study, our study findings, core core. <laughs> corporates these reports of the experiences of regular OI day-to-day -day caregiving, particularly the complex tasks of mobilization and transfers. And here she cites kind of all these other studies that have been done um, 
that showcase the challenges of these caregivers. So this is kind of what you want to do. You want to use references that are relevant in your literature field of study or that are similar to your studies. You want to showcase how you're finding support or differ from those studies and what those differences or similarities could mean. So similarities could also can mean, for example, that this is an urgent area that we need to address. Differences could be, oh, well, maybe our population was different or maybe the or maybe the support that they had was different. Um, so things like that. Okay. So very common mistakes um, in the discussion and conclusion section is really, I see a lot of sometimes people will introduce new findings in the discussion section. Um, so don't include findings that were not already mentioned in your results section. If, you, if you're writing your discussion and you realize that you have findings that aren't included, go back and put those in your results section. Um, you don't want to be putting in like sudden, like new information for, for the um, readers. Another one that I see is that people sometimes overemphasize the impact of their findings. So they make um, kind of grandiose statements um, about kind of what their paper can mean. So maybe, for example, an example would be if you only looked at the experiences of these caregivers, then saying that like this could change the world and it can change how we care for children with OI and et cetera, et cetera. Those are pretty big statements from one singular study that are not that believable. So it actually takes away from your paper and reduces credibility. So just be careful. Um, and then connected to that is failing to provide evidence for your conclusions. So um, any explanations or conjectures you make about what your research means and its contributions or why you think certain things about your findings must be logically backed by whatever is in your results section and other people's research. So if you are making any conjectures about what, um, what a significant result could mean, um, you not only refer back to your own findings, but you need to gather evidence from other studies because it's not enough that just your one study kind of has that um that just your one study has found this and then that's it basically i'm just i'm going to unshare my screen but does anybody have any questions you can also put it in the chat if you want uh one question that's come up that i'll share for people is um what are some techniques or strategies tips advice to kind of starting a, a paper like this and kind of approaching it from the first, from the get-go? Um, make sure you're reading other papers first. Um, so look at papers that have been published in your field um, and try to pick out the key components and how they structured. Every paper will look slightly different. There is like a little bit of room for creativity, but in general, this, the information that you include in each section will look, um, will be the same. Um, but definitely like there's no way around it. You have to read, 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 read. Um, if you have colleagues, if you're in a lab or anything and you have colleagues, like reading your colleagues work, for example, really helps. So I was trained um, initially by reading a lot of my supervisors previously published work um, by sharing with my with my friends, um, things like that. And if you have a supervisor, like go to your go to your supervisor often. If you're just starting, kind of um, work work in like manageable chunks. I would say it's you can't write the paper in one day. Hi, uh, I have a quick question. Hi. Hi. Um. So you were talking in the discussion section about not overextending uh, the impact of your work. Mm -hmm. How do you you know, how do you decide where that range is? Like whether if you're understating or overstating or like where do you find that sweet spot? Yeah, so I would, in terms of finding that sweet spot, like I will say for most um, student papers at this level, it's not, it's not going to change the world. So just make sure that when you do make statements, you're not saying that like, um, because I found X finding, then this will happen. Don't use like statements that are, that are very certain, like this will happen or that this will change care. It probably won't say, I usually use statements like it has the potential to influence policy in the future or that this paper can start, can um, spark further discussions on how we can provide care to children with OI, things like that. So um, always kind of 
try to sit in the realm of like possibility and then offer concrete steps that you can do next. Like if you're going to conduct a second part of the study to extend your work, you can write that. Um, but don't, I, I usually, the sweet spot just comes when you're make sure that you're not saying that like this paper definitely will do X, Y, and Z, because that's where people will challenge you. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Another question that came up was mm -hmm. uh, when you're collaborating with other researchers, other people writing a paper, do you have any strategies for approaching that, sharing the, the, that responsibility? Yeah, so most papers will have multiple co-authors. If you're the lead research assistant, usually like who did, you know, most of the methods, most of the analysis, you'll probably be first author, but you'll have other collaborate, collaborators along the way. Um when you are working with other people on a research paper, um, a have a shared document, but also clearly outline who's going to do what section, um, and make sure that you're doing the section that obviously you know the most about. So if you did most of the study procedures, or you have a research manager or a lab manager that did most of the study procedures, maybe they can give you their notes on how they did it, and you can write it up, or they can write it up. Um, so assign each person to the section that they are best. Um, capable of writing. But in terms of if you are the lead student researcher, which I assume most of us would be, you probably need to, you you probably be the one writing up the results section and writing most of the um, discussion section as well as your introduction. Um, so, but the rest you can kind of split up whatever, whichever, um, depending on who did what area of work the most. And that's usually what I do. And then in the end, when you're done, that paper, that uh, initial draft gets shared with everybody for comments. Um, I don't know, maybe your supervisor will do things differently. This also depends on kind of your lab environment and how they negotiate uh, roles. But in my lab, we've, um, yeah, we usually have a finished draft me and my supervisor will look it over, then we'll send it back out to the whole, all the stakeholders to review the entire manuscript. Um, and then once that's been approved by every co-author, that gets submitted for publication. Excellent. Thank you so much. No problem. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. I'll let maybe Sydney, you can close with um just other, like if there's any other MSWI initiatives, if you guys want to follow us on social media. Absolutely. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. We will have other workshops like this, some created specifically for SciComm. So please stay tuned. Uh, just check your email. And if you have any trouble at all, uh, if you're not getting our emails or if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us. I'm going to just add our email into the chat right now. Um, and yeah, we're really looking forward to everything. So keep an eye on your on your uh, email as well. And we will be posting the recording of this session on our website. And we'll send you out an email to let you know uh, how to find that on our website as well. Thank you so much. And if you have questions for Jenny as well, she is our VP Education on MSWI. So you can always reach out to her through, again, our email. Just ask for Jenny. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I hope that was helpful. See you guys soon, hopefully, once we'll, we'll announce other workshops that we we'll have in the future. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, I think it's just us, Sydney. Okay, I literally forgot to put... Oh, we're still recording. <laughs> All right. <laughs>